All right, good morning, everybody. We're glad that you're here with us this morning. Um, welcome to the Pennsylvania Beef Council's virtual field trip. My name is Caitlin Carey, and I work on behalf of the Pennsylvania Beef Council. Also on the line with us today is Dan Tolan from Shiftology, whom you've all been working with um, to get set up and make sure all the technology's in a row. Um, so we have about five different classrooms tuned in. So we're gonna do a quick um, around the classroom introduction and then we'll head out to the farm with our producer, Frank Stoltzfus. Um, so he's at Masonic Village's farm today and we're gonna see a, a taste of what he does on a daily basis. So first, let's head to Anthony's um, classroom at Southern Maine Community College, joining us from Maine. Good morning, everybody. All right, next we're gonna head to the Mifflin County Academy of Science and Technology in joining us from Lewistown, Pennsylvania. Good morning. Good morning. All right, and next we have Sun Valley High School, which is located in Aston, Pennsylvania. Good morning, guys. <laughs> All right, and finally we have um, Benjamin Franklin High School in Philadelphia. Good morning. We'll have about 10 more students joining us shortly. All right, good morning, guys. Thank you. So with that, we're going to um, welcome you all again, and we'll head out to the farm and get started with our PA beef producer, Frank Stoltzfus. So I'm going to let Frank introduce himself, who he is, where he's from, and what he does. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's not real sunny here in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania today. You can see <laughs> in the background we have a, a fog roll in, but uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to show you our cattle and, and tell you about our operation. Um, I am the farm manager here at Masonic Village Farm in Elizabethtown, Pennsylvania in Lancaster County. Um, we're proud to say that we have some of the best farmland in the world. Uh, and I'm very privileged to be able to, uh, to farm that. And we do most of our harvesting on all of our grasslands with cattle. So our main goal is to produce protein for everyone to consume. And we do that through the grass and through the cattle. Um, we have a, a, about 600 acres that's in production. About half of that is in a row crop and about half of that is in grass. And we run uh, somewhere between 150 and 180 brood cows. And uh, uh, just an explanation, we call a brood cow, that would be a mama cow who has a baby uh, year after year after year. And that's how we produce our calves. Uh, after the calves are produced, we have our own feedlot. We'll be showing you some of the cattle that uh, through the feedlot and what we have as our finished product. So we're gonna to try to explain the life cycle of the cattle uh, from birth to market. And uh, as we go along, Caitlin, I think has some of your questions and she can just interrupt me anytime and throw in those questions. That's all right with you, Caitlin? Yep, sounds great. All right, so where we start, the, the very beginning, uh, Someone has to produce the purebred genetics that go into the crossbreeding programs all across this country. And so we are a seed stock producer. We are producing the base cattle to go out into programs and crossbreed cattle for uh, hybrid rigor and heterosis. So in the background, you can see some of our shorthorn cows and baby calves. Uh, these calves were born this spring. Uh, this white calf standing right here behind me uh, is just only about four months old. So you can see they grow really fast. Uh, when they hit the ground, uh, when they're born, they're somewhere between uh, 60 and 90 pounds. Um, so by the time we wean them at six months of age, they're between 500 and 600 pounds. So they really put on a lot of weight uh, fast. And so as we... Uh, graze cows all summer, we try to keep them on fresh grass. We do what's called rotational grazing. So our cattle are on a section of grass for a short period of time, anywhere from four to seven days, depending, depending on the size of the lot and how many cattle are in it and how fast the grass is growing. So we put them in there for four to seven days, uh, then they move to the next lot. That grass then gets a chance to recover for about 28 to 35 days, depending on how much rain we get, how much sunshine we get. And then they go back in there for another five to seven days. So we have lots of lots all over the farm. 
uh, small acreage, maybe five to six acres in a lot. And uh, they just move continually all summer long uh, from about the 20th of March. Well, sometimes it's still snowing in March, but uh, we, we try to rotate real early and right up until sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas until we take them off the grass. So our uh, cow program is totally uh, dependent on the grass that we produce, not only for their summer feed, but also for their winter feed. Because off those same paddocks, off those same lots, when the grass is growing faster than the cattle can consume it, uh, we pull the cattle off for a little longer period of time, and then we make hay out of that. Um, a, late, a little later on in the program, you'll see what our feeding program looks like for wintering our cows and also the, the feedlot program. But that's kind of our base herd. Uh, our purebred herd is a herd of shorthorns. And so I'll tell you a little bit about the shorthorn breed. Uh, we do have more than one breed here at Masonic Village Farm, but shorthorns are our base breed. Uh, shorthorns are a British breed, much like Angus. You've heard of them, I'm sure. In Herefords, uh, they come from Britain, and they can be red, solid red, uh, solid white, or any combination of that in between. So they can be red with white marks, or uh, what we call roan. As we move cattle around here, you'll see some that are roan colored. Uh, if I could, I'm going to ask the guys to kind of go around and maybe move some of the cattle up towards us. They're they're walking away from us just a bit, um, and uh, so shorthorns are, are prevalent uh, in the Midwest, a lot of shorthorns in the South. Uh, they are a British breed, and they, they do mate up really well uh, with the other British breeds for crossbreeding programs. So as, they, as people buy breeding stock from us, they'll either buy uh, females that are pregnant or maybe uh, small calves uh, after they're weaned as show projects. But we want to sell them uh, quality product and Along with that, we do sell some bulls, and we're going to get into the breeding program just a bit later, but um, the shorthorns are a, a really solid English breed that do really well at muscling. They also are a very docile breed, uh, and they work really well in the show program. There is a huge uh, junior shorthorn program that runs uh, a, a major show year after year after year. Yep. Now, Frank, one question that we did have was kind of, you're talking about the variety of cows that you have on your farm and the 150 to 180 mama cows. How do you keep them all straight? How do you know who's who and kind of keep track of each individual animal? Yeah, that's, that's a good question, Caitlin. Um, if, if you can see, uh, I don't know if we can get any real close here or not, but uh, every, all of the cattle have a, uh, an ear tag in them. Actually, they have two ear tags in them. One is a visual ear tag that you can see. And these cattle behind me here, they have an orange tag that we can see. I can see number 13 there in the background real easily. Um, so we can see those. You'll see the calf uh, beside it as a 13A. I might not be able to see that on the camera, but that's a pair. So they're paired up together. So we follow them with their tag. They also get an an individual electronic identification tag. That's a little square button about the size of a quarter that goes, uh, is a button that goes inside their ear. And then we have a reader. Every time we work those cattle uh, through the chute, they go through the reader and we can identify exactly what we did to them, vaccinations, deworming, whatever we've done to the cattle at that point is then recorded electronically. Perfect, thank you. Yeah. So we have more than just the shorthorns, and um, we also have a herd of crossbred cows, which is actually the majority of our cows. We only run about uh, 50 shorthorn cows, but about another 100 to 120 cows are crossbred cows. And our base breed there is Angus, so those cattle are black. Um, they, will, they all calve in the spring. Uh, everything calves here for us in late March, the month of April, and early May. Uh, we have wow. about a 60-day breeding season, so that gives us automatically a 60-day calving season. Uh, we like to keep that grouping tight together, 
so that we can process, identify, and vaccinate all those cattle as groups. So we're not doing it um, all year long. So the calves are born in uh, spring. The cows are uh, put to pasture at that point in time. And then they, they graze all summer long in the fall they're weaned. So we're at that point right now. So these baby calves we're seeing in the background, that white heifer calf right there, uh, she's about five months old. She's just about ready to be weaned here in the next couple of weeks. We'll wean them, take them away from their, their mother, and um, they'll go into a lot by themselves. <clears throat> the important thing is that these mama cows are bred back again. And uh, I think we're going to go into the next section now and talk a little bit about breeding. So, Caitlin, if you have <clears throat> some questions for me, maybe we can run some cows around here. We'll bring a bull out to show you the bull and, and we'll go kind of the next section. Yep, that would be great. So related to um, kind of breeding, how long is a cow pregnant for? <laughs> okay, a, a cow is pregnant for about nine and a half months. Um, some will go a little longer, some will go a little shorter. So our, our goal is for them to have a calf uh, once a year, every year, uh, in the same month. So a cow has two jobs. Uh, and for us, she is either carrying a calf that she's pregnant with and or nursing. A lot of the time, they're doing both things. They're nursing a calf while they're pregnant. Perfect. And then can you also touch on, you know, you talked about how that breeding window and calving window is short. Can you touch on why that's also important in terms of what we're going to hit on later with feeding cows and marketing um, fed steers? Sure. Just keeping um, them in consistent groups. Yeah. As, as we calve, we want those groups to be fairly tight. So the cattle are all the same age, all the same size. As they grow, uh, we want them to grow consistently. Um, if you have cattle that are varying sizes or varying ages that you're trying to feed, it's very difficult to formulate that feed just for that specific group of cattle. Um, when we talk about our feeding programs, I'll go through how that is very important that the cattle be of consistent size and age as we put them through the pen. So if we can start that in breeding season, <coughs> and carry that through the whole year, it just makes it easier for us to feed the cattle as they get older. Perfect, that makes complete sense. And then while we're waiting for the bulls to arrive, can you talk about, I know we've kind of touched on it, but one of the questions was um, kind of, do you have a single herd that you work with from start to finish and repeat the cycle or several herds at various stages? So I think we're kind of getting the picture that, you know, you have, a variety of cows at different stages. So it's kind of a repetitive cycle, but if you could just touch on that briefly. Sure. For us here at the farm, uh, at this farm, all of our cows are spring bred cows, are bred for spring bred calves. Uh, they're, they're bred in the summer uh, to calve in March and April. That gives us that group that we put in the feedlot. There are other producers across the country that calve at different times. In the South, they like to calve in September and October. Uh, in, the, in the Midwest, a lot of those guys will calve in January and um, so that they have time for their crop work. But um, we purchase cattle from them to put in our feedlot as the year goes along so that we can keep cattle ready at all, all times. One of the bulls is coming out here now, Caitlin, so we'll see if we can Perfect. get a get a shot at him. Uh, this is an, an, an Angus Maine Anjou bull that we use in our crossbreeding program. And uh, he is about six years old. And we have um, a total of eight bulls that we use. Um, and so we rotate the bulls through the cows as needed for the crossbreeding program. He's going to walk away from us. We'll have one of the guys go down and try to try to bring him back up for us. Um, but we'll use the the uh, Angus Maine or the Angus Simmental cross bulls on purebred shorthorns. 
we'll use some of the purebred shorthorn bulls on some of the uh, Angus main crosses, and we rotate those breeds back and forth uh, in order to get heterosis, which is hybrid vigor. A calf will perform better if it's of multiple breeds. He's, he's not one to cooperate for us here right now, Caitlin, but we're, we'll get him back up here. No um, worries. We even have a kind of a picture of a bull that we can even show the students right now as well. Okay. okay. But we do, we do in our crossbreeding program, and this is true all across the country, uh, try to rotate breeds back and forth so that, so that we can have this hybrid vigor. Uh, it's, it's proven science that if you have multiple breeds, uh, two is good, three is better, four is even better. Uh, but once you get past four breeds in, in a rotation, it, you're starting to lose some of that. But it, it really is proven science that, uh, that we can do that. Our cattle will gain better, they'll be healthier, they'll be more vigorous. He's that calm that he doesn't want to come up here right now. But the bull you saw on the picture there is one of the bulls that we produced. Uh, he went into production in a farm in, uh, in northern Pennsylvania. So we sell bulls and breeding stock kind of uh, all over the eastern seaboard. See if he'll come up this way. Got another question for me, Caitlin. Yes, yeah, so one of the questions was kind of related to some of the natural disasters and storms that most recently just went on in the south. Um, so one of the students was wondering if you have a plan in place on the farm, um, if there were any sort of bad storms or, you know, where would you put your cattle to make sure that they're safe? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And here's the bull. We're seeing up close and personal <laughs> right now, I believe. Um, in fact, I'll answer that question after I talk about the bull. Is that okay? Yep, that's great. Uh, this, this bull is ace. Uh, he is uh, seven years old, uh, and he has done a really good job of performing for us. He's going to go eat some hay right now. Um, <laughs> he, he produces somewhere around 25 to 30 calves a year. Each bull will produce about that many. Um, we keep track of where they are in the pastures, which cows they're with, so we know who are his calves and uh, who are, which calf was sired by each of the bulls. But let's go, let's take the bull back down, let's take him out, and uh, our next segment will be talking about feed, but I'll get back to your question uh, about um, the uh, disaster preparedness. Um, yes, we have tornadoes, we have floods, we have hurricanes, um, we have a plan in place uh, if we lose power, if all of our power goes out and we're unable to feed uh, mechanically, we have a plan in place where we have feed available that we can feed by hand. So even if we don't have electricity to run our silo unloaders or run our conveyors, uh, get our feed out of storage, we have a way to feed cattle in the short time uh, if we do that without mechanical help. So that's one of our plans. If we were to have a lightning strike or something like that on one of our barns, uh, we have multiple barns so we can move cattle from place to place. Um, and we're able to uh, have enough segments on the farm that are either higher than other places in case of a flood or, or safe places that we can move the cattle to. Now, to go a little further than that, it doesn't happen very often. It, it really doesn't. You hear of this all over the country. Um, we've, we've not had one of those in a long, long time. We also have a standby generator uh, for our feedlots. So if we do lose power and, and it's not a real bad storm situation, uh, we can just start up our generator and we can feed just like normal. So we don't even miss a beat. Awesome. That's so great. It's kind of just, you know, like our moms always remind us to have extra water and stuff in the pantry if there's a storm coming. So it's glad to hear you guys do the same thing on the farm. Um, so if you want, we can start kind of talking about the feedlot segment. And, you know, I know you have a display of feed to show us the variety of things that those cattle eat once they get to that point. We do. And uh, we're going to move over here to a display we have uh, with our feed stuff. And not every, not all the cattle get fed the same thing. Uh, that's pretty obvious. Not all people eat the same things. So our, our base diet for our cow herd, as I mentioned earlier, is grass. 
okay? So all of the cows are on grass for most of the year, from certainly from April to November. Uh, once they come off grass, uh, then they're on stored feed stuff, which is routinely just hay that we make off those same pastures. For most, so most of the cattle, uh, the cow herd, are on pasture grass and hay made from those same pastures. Once the cattle are weaned, uh, they come into lots or smaller pastures, and um, they're they're fed a variety of, of feeds. And I'll, I'll go through them right now. We're gonna get a few more cattle here in the background. Whoop! That wasn't good. <laughs> Okay, um, yeah, just give me a second here. Okay, we're good. Uh, so we'll start to talk about the feed. Uh, this first feed is just regular corn. So this is corn that comes out of the field that we shell through our combine and it comes into our bins. And then as we're getting ready to feed it, we grind it into about quarters. So that's quarters or eighths of a kernel of corn. So a kernel of corn, if I can get one here, looks about like that. I don't know if you can see that, but that's just a, a kernel of corn that comes out of the, an ear, and then it is rolled and ground, and it, it looks like this. So that's, that's our base corn. So that's where our energy comes from. Uh, cattle need kind of three separate things. They need energy, which comes from the corn. They need protein, and they need roughage. So this is our energy source. So the next feed we use um, is actually a byproduct. And this is distiller's grain. And distiller's comes from the ethanol uh, plants across the country. They distill corn, um, take out the energy part of it, and we get the protein that's left. So we take that dried distiller's grain and bring it in and we mix it in with our feed. It's a very, very good source of, of protein. Uh, and the cattle really like it. It's got a really nice taste to it. So it's just, it's in a meal form. It comes real dry, kind of looks like oat brand or uh, cereal that you might eat in the morning. Uh, and it's got a really good taste to it too. So then our next feed is what basically goes into our feedlot. And this is called corn silage. So in this, we take the whole plant that's in the field and we harvest it as one plant. We chop it in small pieces. Most of these pieces are anywhere from a quarter to three quarters of an inch long. You can see that one right there is about three quarters of an inch long. And that's our base feed for the, for the feedlot cattle. Um, and how, that, how this works is it comes in as a green um, plant about 68% moisture. We put it in our upright silos, and in about three weeks' time, um, that is fermented. So it goes through a fermentation process. After it's fermented, then we start to feed it. So as cattle go into the feedlot, they start to get these feeds, but how do we know what to give them when? We work with a, a qualified nutritionist who <laughs> works with us sees what ingredients we have available, sees what stages our cattle are in, and then we formulate rations to go uh, feed those cattle. And that's called a TMR. This would be a total mix ration that I made this morning uh, for a lot of the cattle in the feedlot. And it is a combination of all of these feeds, the corn, the silver's grain, the corn silage. Uh, we also put some mineral in that. And then there's one more product we use, um, and you guys call it sugar. We call it molasses, okay? So we add some molasses to this to add some flavor to it, and <clears throat> the cattle just eat and eat and eat and eat. Um, the, the finishing cattle will eat up to 40 to 45 pounds of this ration every day. So it takes a lot of feed. Here at Masonic Village, we use about 4 million pounds of feed a year. So... The one thing that you guys probably do every morning is take a one a day. How many of you take a one a day? Probably everybody does that. Well, this is our one a day right here. This is our mineral. Our mineral comes, it's, it's a rock mineral. It, it has all the minerals in that the cattle need. Everything that they need um, 
for bone structure, for meat, for performance, for growth. Um, it's all in that mineral. It's formulated especially for our cattle. This is a custom mineral that we get made. And then finally, our last roughage is hay. So this is hay that we made out of our fields this year. Um, it's our base uh, ration for our cow herd all winter long. The tons and tons and tons of this hay. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the big square bales in the field that are eight feet long and four feet wide and three feet high. We make about 2,000 of those bales every year uh, to feed our cows. We also use a little bit of hay uh, to in the feedlot to get our cattle started so that rumen function is good and we have really healthy cattle as they're going through the feedlot. Um, Perfect. Now, Frank, you just briefly touched on the variety of feed. And now, can you explain briefly why can cattle eat grass and those different things that we just saw, um, but say us humans, we can't? Sure. Um, and this is one thing that, that makes the cattle industry so effective and so sustainable. Cattle are able, because they have what's called a rumen, or they have four uh, stomachs. One of those is a rumen. They're able to take this real roughage, this real forage, like this hay and like this corn silage. It, we couldn't eat that, but they can eat that. They can process that through their rumen and really make a high quality protein product that we eat every day. So this is why they're so important in, in the ecosystem, really. There are thousands, literally millions of acres across this country that could not produce food, ha would it not be for cattle being able to harvest that grass on their own and turn that into protein. Awesome. Now another area that we had some questions that I'm hoping we can hit on here before we get to the live Q&A session um, was kind of about the veterinary involvement. So obviously we all know, you know, it's the temperatures are getting cooler. Us as humans, we're starting to get coughs and things like that. So um, I'm sure your cattle get sick every now and then. So how do you handle those situations and kind of what protocols do you use? Uh, maybe touch on beef quality assurance. Sure. Um, I, I want to touch on something real quick while they're here. Go ahead. Three head of cattle in the background here. I'm hoping you can see them. Two black ones and kind of a reddish kind of, of calf. Those cattle are what we would call finished cattle. They came out of our feedlot this morning. Um, they are marketable cattle. They are cattle that are ready to go to the rail to produce uh, beef uh, here in this part of the country. Um, and so they are called finished cattle because they have been fed uh, a higher energy ration. They have what we call cover on or a certain amount of, of fat thickness over their back so that they uh, can grade either choice or prime. When we do feed, the high, high majority of our cattle are fed to the uh, choice grade and some to prime. So let me go back now and touch a little bit on our, our veterinarian uh, association and our alliance with them and how they work with us. <clears throat> our goal is to not have sick cattle ever. That's our goal. And we don't have very many. We have very few. To get that goal accomplished, the first thing we do every year in February, we have a meeting with our veterinarian. Uh, we look at all the things that went well for the year. We look at the things that didn't go so well. And we say, where can we improve? What do we have to do? to be better. And so we have a standard vaccination program for all the calves that are born on the farm, for all the cattle that we receive that go into the feedlot. There's a standard vaccination program for them. We are moving away from injections. A lot of our vaccinations now because of BQA protocols are intranasal. So they'll get their vaccine through their nose and into their system without invading their skin. So that's one thing we really uh, appreciate uh, having been developed, that we don't have to invade those cattle nearly as often to protect them. So the, the next thing we do after that protocol is put in order, we carry it through. Every time it calls for a vaccination, we give it. We're constantly watching cattle uh, for performance. If we see one that's off feed for some reason, we try to figure out what's going on and fix that. But it doesn't happen very often. Um, 
we use no antibiotics in our feed. We use no implants here at Masonic Village. Um, we do occasionally have to give a vaccine or a uh, injection of an antibiotic. If there's an animal that gets pneumonia, for instance, in a really bad situation, uh, we may have to give a shot of an antibiotic. But in all those instances, uh, we follow the label very closely and uh, we look at our withholding times, meaning uh, how long do we have to keep them out of the food chain? But most of the time, we multiply that by three or four times. So if it says they can't go for 60 days, oftentimes it's 100 or 120 days. And so that is through their system and, and not an issue. Perfect, thank you. And can you just briefly, before we go into the live questions, you mentioned BQA. Can you just explain briefly what BQA stands for um, and what it's meant for your farm? BQA is a program uh, that the National uh, Cattlemen's Beef Association, NCBA, has <clears throat> put into place many years ago. And it's BQA stands for Beef Quality Assurance. And there are a set of protocols that we follow. In order for us to be certified BQA members, we have to follow this standard protocol. It has to do with how we handle our cattle, what our facilities look like, our loading chutes, our handling facilities, our, our floors, are our floors slippery, uh, too slippery? Do they have enough traction? Do we use enough bedding? All those issues are in BQA. Uh, how do we graze our cattle? Is there always enough grass there in front of them? It's, it's all around the quality of life, if you want to put it that way, for the bovines, for the cattle. It's not about is it easy for us or not easy for us. If it's difficult, we'll still do it. Uh, we want to make the quality of life for these cattle as good as we can from the time they're born until the time really we want to harvest them uh, for our own use. So BQA really encompasses a lot of things. Um, it even gets into how the animals are transported uh, from farm to farm or from farm to market. So it's a real comprehensive plan that the, that the uh, National Cattlemen's Beef Association has put together. And we try to follow those uh, protocols very, very closely. In fact, a couple of years ago, uh, Nicole nominated us for an award and Masonic Village was able to get the National Beef Quality, Quality Assurance Award uh, in the cow-calf uh, segment of the industry uh, covering the whole country. So we take that very seriously here at Masonic Village Farm. Perfect, thanks so much, Frank. So now we're gonna move into the live question and answer session. So first we're gonna head to Southern Maine Community College. Um, so we're gonna unmute you guys and see if you have any lingering questions that um, haven't been answered. So any questions for Frank? Nope, did we hit on everything? All right, if not, oh, try again. Oh, sure, we can. So we'll head to um, Mifflin County and see if they have any. So hello guys, any questions that you still have remaining? Some of the students would like to participate and ask questions. Don't introduce yourself. Hello, my name is Austin. And we just talked about how many um, cattle will finish cattle be sent to So how many finished cattle are sent to market? Okay, um, in our feedlot, we have a capacity of uh, 300 and we can put the cattle through there uh, in about six to seven months they remain in our feedlot about six to seven months so that means we're finishing around uh, 550 to 600 a year we have several markets that we use uh, that are the cattle the meat is going directly to restaurants in New York City in Baltimore and in Pittsburgh so we are marketing cattle on a weekly basis but we finish out between 550 and 600 a year, um, and that equates down to around 12 a week 
uh, leave our farm uh, every week all year long. Awesome. So what other questions do we have out of Mifflin County? My name's Aiden Brennan, and I want to know, um, whenever cows get, uh, like, so aged, uh, what, do you do, uh, what do you guys do with them? Okay. You hear, uh, did you hear him, Frank? I think I got it. What do we okay. do with our cows that age out? Is that the question? Yeah. Get, Perfect. Okay. I guess the first response is, we do use cows for quite a long period of time. Uh, we've had ha cows here producing calves as, as many as 15 and 16 years. Uh, that's not the norm. Normally our cows uh, last probably around 10 calves uh, and then they start to get a little less productive. The calves don't grow quite as well or maybe they won't get pregnant. So our culling program is, first of all, if a cow is not pregnant, then she leaves the program. What we do for those cows is we take them and we feed them for about 30 to 45, sometimes 60 days, we'll get them off grass, put them on some uh, ener higher energy feed, and then they'll go into the meat market just like uh, the rest of the cattle do. Uh, most of them are used for uh, ground beef. A lot of that type of beef is what's used for McDonald's or Wendy's or those types of places where they don't need a lot of finish or a lot of cover uh, or marbling in the cattle. So most of those cattle are gone for ground beef, uh, but they go right into the food chain just like everything else. Perfect. Let's head over to Sun Valley High School and see what questions they might have. Great. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. How many breeds have like, number wise? I didn't get that one, Caitlin. So how many different breeds are represented on your farm? Am I understanding your question? Yes. Awesome. Okay, we only have one purebred breed, and that's the Shorthorns. Uh, we do have uh, several purebred Angus bulls, so that's two. We have some Angus Simmental bulls, so that would add Simmental, that would be three. And then we have an Angus Maine bull, so that would be four. There's basically four breeds here at Masonic Village, Shorthorn, Angus, Maine Anjou, and Simmental. Awesome. Any other questions out of Sun Valley? No? All right, we'll head over to Benjamin Franklin High School. Um, hello. Um, hello process easy for cattle? Did you hear me? Is the breeding process easy for cattle? Yes. Um, yeah, we, uh, the, the process for us is fairly easy. Um, we use a lot of natural service where the bulls are introduced to the cows uh, for a certain period of time, so they just run right with the cows. Uh, that service is natural. We do use artificial insemination on our virgin heifers. Uh, and the reason we do that on that group is because they're, they are our newest genetics. So they should be our best genetics. So we are introducing bulls uh, through artificial insemination or frozen semen. Uh, and we breed those heifers so that we can increase the genetic ability of our cattle a little quicker. Um, it's easy to handle the, uh, the bred heifers in groups like that uh, to breed. And we run about a 65 to 70% efficiency rating uh, on breeding those cattle artificially. We do run about 95 to 97% uh, conception rate on our natural service bulls. So most of the cows get pregnant to the bulls in that 60 day period. Awesome. And with artificial insemination, um, you said you're using frozen semen. So does that allow you to source genetics from farther across the country? Yes, we can use uh, genetics from anywhere in the world, really. Uh, we use bulls out of Canada, uh, some bulls out of the, uh, the Midwest. But uh, we're able to, to look at their uh, results uh, through genetic testing and also through their progeny and then make a selection on those bulls and have that semen shipped to us. And uh, then we can use that on our, our newest crop of, of heifers. 
Awesome. Any other questions, Benjamin Franklin? Good, good morning. Um, one question that one of my students had concerning cattle. Um, another question that the students had was, what happens to the cow if it's nearing um, their they're dying, what happens to, to the cow? It's a process for them. You might have to help me, Caitlin. I couldn't quite hear the question. Yeah, I didn't hear the first part. Can you repeat that? Sorry. One of the students wants to know what happens when the cow was dying off? What's the process for ensuring that the food is safe? What happens to the, um, the flesh of the cow? So if a cow's older? Yes, or if it has an infection, what's the process? What happens? Mm -hmm. So I guess okay. I could help. Go ahead, Frank. I think I think I'll, I'll phrase that uh, question just a bit differently. Um, what do we do with cattle that are ailing and and can't come back to production? I, I think that might be the question. Um, most of the time, the very largest percentage of the time, we get those cattle, and the, there are only a few of those, but we get them back into production, and everything is fine. For the very few that we don't. Um, there are two processes for us. If they're, if they're ailing or failing and we can't, we don't have a recovery plan for them, um, they will actually go into uh, dog food. So I, I don't want to make this sound morbid or anything, but it's a way that those cattle can be used, not put into the food chain, but still be of some value to us and to society. So they can be used uh, for dog food. In, in the rare, rare event that one is, we cannot recover or cannot uh, use for that process, then they are euthanized uh, using a process that's described um, in the uh, BQA um, manual. And then they are composted and we actually do use them for compost, but there are very few of those. Yep, and then to hit on your question in terms of would it ever reach the food chain, so all cattle are going to be processed through a USDA federally inspected packing plant, so all meat that's consumed, whether you're buying it at the grocery store, in a restaurant, it's all been federally inspected by um, the USDA. So just know that all meat that you're eating, all beef is safe um, because it goes through rigorous screenings and different testing. Um, at the packing plant. Does that answer your question? Yeah, so, so along with that, it, if the cattle has a disease and it's used for compost, how are, you, how are we ensuring that um, that the, the, cow, the cattle who are, who's eating that compost are not being infected by whatever disease the prior cattle had? Okay. Um, the compost is not used at all ever for feed. That compost is used as fertilizer, uh, just like uh, a commercial fertilizer that you would purchase uh, for the crop. So it is, it is never uh, reestablished re into the cattle in, in any way, shape, or form. Perfect. Thank you. So with that, we're going to head back to Sun Valley. I think we missed one of you guys' questions. So we'll head back to you. How much beef does one cow produce? How much beef? Yes. All right. So Frank, with your cattle um, that you send to market, about how many pounds of beef would be produced from one, one cow, one steer? OK. That, that's that's a good question, and it's also a complicated answer. Um, the market animal, just like the one you see standing in the background here, okay, that's a really good picture of a market animal. That steer weighs probably around 1,300 or 1,350 pounds. Now, certainly, we're not going to eat that much out of that animal. The carcass of that animal will weigh somewhere around 800 to 850 pounds. We use a 62% uh, uh, what's the word I want here? 62% 62 of that carcass will become uh, meat. Then, as that carcass is as that is uh, processed, 
then you lose bone out of that yet. So actually there's only around 600 pounds that comes from that 1300 pound animal. Uh, the rest of that is, is byproducts or co-products that are used for other things like the hide, um, the, the legs, the feet, the bone goes into meal, the, the blood, all that, all that is used in other, uh, industries. And so a lot of that gets used. There's very, very little waste, uh, in the cattle when they're consumed, but about 50% of what you see live is what's on your plate. Perfect. So with that, um, we're running out of time, running short on time. So we're going to head to Southern Maine Community College and see if you guys had any um, lingering questions from your list. Right. So, Frank, I think the question really is asking, um, do you have to modify what you're feeding in the summer months versus the winter months due to kind of the needs of the cow in terms of calories and things like that? Yes, we do. That's the short answer. Yes. <laughs> we are modifying what we're doing to the cattle on a constant basis. That's what uh, a manager does, a ranch manager or a cattle manager uh that's their job to make sure the cattle have everything that they need throughout their lifetime so as we're going through the summer and it's getting dry let's say not like this year but it's getting dry we'll have to move the cattle quicker or faster we may get to a point uh sometimes in august where we'll have to pull them off faster completely because it's not growing fast enough so we'll give them hay for a 30-day period until the grass comes back the opposite is also true. What if it rains too much? That's what we had this summer. We had rain, rain, rain. So we were we were getting into pastures that were just too wet uh, to produce anything. They were turning them into mud. So we had to take them off of there, put them into a, another pasture, another lot that was producing enough feed for them. So we're we're modifying that. We're managing that on a daily basis, every day of the year. Perfect. Any other questions from Southern Maine? I think we're good. All right. Well, again, I just want to thank all of you. Awesome. Again, I just want to thank all of you for your time and interest in joining in in our first ever virtual beef field trip. And again, I just want to thank Frank for all the time and effort him and his crew put into having all the cattle on display and the feed on display to really show you guys um, a really a brief snapshot of what happens on his farm every day. And again, if you have continued questions or things you want to further discuss, um, feel free to email me um, and or reach out to the Pennsylvania Beef Council at any time. We're really your go-to resource um, for anything beef related. So with that, um, I believe Dan's going to unmute you all and we're all going to thank Frank and Let's all say thank you to Frank. Welcome. Thanks for coming. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. We'll see you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for joining.